I'm sure you've all been in a car when you come across a speed limit forcing you to slow down sometimes to give you more control and other times for environmental reasons. With ships however, things are a little different. Slowing down still has the benefit of reduced fuel consumption, but at the same time ships can become harder to control and potentially at much greater risk of an accident. So much so that in some areas such as the Houston Ship Channel, they've issued alerts to ships instructing them that they must override power limitation systems before they're allowed to enter. So what's going on? Are they seriously telling ships that they should be going faster? When ships are built, they're fitted with engines that should see them through most scenarios that they'll encounter throughout their service life, yet still minimise fuel consumption for both environmental and cost reasons. Large container ships will probably be designed with a single giant propeller so that they can efficiently run for thousands of miles. Cruise ships, on the other hand, will have plenty of thrusters and engines to increase manoeuvrability but be slightly less efficient at higher speeds due to hull turbulence around thruster tunnels. Ocean liners are a bit of a blend between the two, still with plenty of engines and thrusters but maybe doors over the thruster tunnels to increase efficiency when running at the higher speeds needed to deliver a true liner service. Of course, you can only do so much at the design stage because all ships still need to be able to vary their speed to meet service schedules and for operational reasons like collision avoidance. So what you will often find is that ship operators tweak the vessels to try and make them run more efficiently, ultimately reducing costs. The easiest way is with a bit of software that sits between the telegraph and the main engine, intercepting orders to make them more efficient. It reminds me a bit of this video's sponsor NordVPN which works in a similar way, sitting between your computer and the internet. Rather than connecting to the web directly, you connect via one of NordVPN's over 5,000 ultra-fast servers located in over 60 countries. Traffic flowing between your device and Nord server flows through an encrypted tunnel helping to secure your data from cyber criminals. For example, if someone set up a fake hotspot, they could easily intercept data flowing from your device to the internet, but by creating an encrypted link to Nord server instead, all they'll get is gibberish. For me though, the biggest benefit of NordVPN is that it masks my IP address, making it look as if I'm browsing from their server instead. When I'm travelling abroad, I can select a server in the UK and every website I visit will read my IP address as a UK based address, no matter where I am in the world. Not only does it protect my personal data, but it also means that I can circumvent any geo restrictions. If I'm researching for one of these videos, the sites I visit will think I am still in the UK, so the information provided will be the same as it would be if I was at home. Visit nordvpn.com slash casual navigation and get NordVPN and four months for free if you take out a two year plan on top of their 30 day money back guarantee. Anyway, in the same way as NordVPN sits between your device and the internet, we'd just mentioned that ships have a piece of software that sits between their telegraph and the main engine. It's called a power limitation system and is designed to interpret the input from the conning officer and feed it to the engine in the most efficient way possible. For example, if the order is from 50% power to full ahead, rather than instantly increasing the engine's revolutions, it'll do it gradually. Or, if the ship is diesel electric, it might only increase up to a speed that can be delivered by the generators already running, rather than starting another, or worse, causing the PEMS to draw extra power and black out the ship. Most of the time it's a fantastic system because in the open ocean, it really doesn't matter if it takes a few extra minutes to increase power, especially when you benefit from reduced fuel consumption and wear on the machinery. There are a few situations, however, when the power limitation system itself could cost you more money in one go than it is cumulatively saved over its entire lifetime. The most obvious is a crash stop. When ships undergo sea trials, they're tested to see in how many ships lengths they can stop when you immediately run the engines astern. If you've added a power limitation system since the ship was tested, your trial data may be completely out of date. Fortunately, it's reasonably easy to program a limitation system to know that when the engine is running ahead, if the telegraphs are moved to full astern, the bridge is attempting a crash stop. On the ships I used to work on, the system would detect an emergency manoeuvre was required and help you get there quicker by shutting off the fuel conservation requirements and reverting to just preventing a blackout. When it comes to slow speed manoeuvring however, it can be a little harder to detect whether an order is an emergency or just over enthusiastic. In some cases, you wouldn't mind if it takes a little longer and conserves fuel, but at other times, it might be the difference between running aground and staying in the channel. Of course, different ships all have different manoeuvring characteristics anyway, so one with a power limitation system may be more manoeuvrable than one without. The most important thing is that the ship's pilot and crew know what to expect from their own vessel. 
This is where areas like the Houston Ship Channel have started to have a problem. When a large vessel arrives in the area, it will first pick up a marine pilot who's there to provide the bridge team with expert knowledge of the local area. Upon boarding, the first thing they'll do is discuss the vessel's handling characteristics. Well, actually I'll lie, the first thing's usually starting the coffee machine, but a close second is moving on to the master pilot exchange. The ship's captain will share all the vital information about the vessel, including things like the engine power, response time, whether it's direct drive, gear, diesel electric, and things like that. Essentially, the pilot will be brought up to speed so that they know how the vessel will respond to different orders while navigating in the confined waters of the ship channel. What they were finding, however, is that more and more vessels were being fitted with power limitation systems that modified how the ships responded. Most would disable the system as a standard part of their pre-arrival routing, but some would forget and some even found that they had systems that couldn't be disabled. What this meant is that sometimes the pilots might have found themselves conning a vessel with software that would interpret their orders in the most fuel efficient way, rather than the way that they would have expected with direct control. Again, on a regular day when everything goes to plan, that might not be bad, but when things go wrong, you want the vessel to respond as you expect. Navigating in a narrow channel gives you all sorts of interactive effects that require constant adjustments on the engines and rudders. For example, bank effect can push your bows across the channel and suck your stern in, requiring a quick rudder movement and a burst of power to correct. Similarly, gusts of wind can blow you off centre, pushing you quickly to one side where bank effect then kicks in, again potentially requiring heavy engine and rudder movements to correct. You need the ship to respond as quickly as possible, which, unfortunately, might not be in the most fuel efficient way possible. Sure, on long passages in safe water, power limitations do a fantastic job, but in confined water, where there's a risk of the ship running aground and really causing an environmental disaster, they may just end up costing you more than they can ever save.